Okay, so back around 2011 to 2015, my old friend and I used to go on little photoshoot expeditions to abandoned places all over the state of Virginia. If you search up a lot of the top upvoted posts from Reddit from around that time, you'll find that many of those pictures are taken by my buddy and me. We don't do it anymore due to having had one too many close calls with cops and security, but we had an amazing portfolio of pictures from those days, along with a lot of cool stories. I would honestly recommend Urbex or Rorex or whatever you want to call it to anyone with a love for the post-apocalyptic or any budding photographers seeking darker inspiration. However, this recommendation comes with a warning. There are some really fascinating derelict properties out there. We'll call them derps, short for derelict properties, but not a single one of them is worth getting hurt over. If a place seems too dangerous or out of reach, there's no shame in passing it up. I'm not saying this because I got badly hurt or anything. I'm saying it because of something I witnessed. I didn't come away with any life-changing trauma and this story isn't some John Carpenter fright fest, so don't get your hopes up. But after all these years, I still think about this one place and it still gives me the creeps. It was July of 2013 when my buddy texted me about an abandoned slaughterhouse out in the middle of nowhere. Immediately my interest was piqued because among all the weird and wonderful shooting locations that he had come up with, a slaughterhouse topped the list. Even the most basic minimalist shots would be made insanely creepy by captioning them Old Slaughterhouse. And in terms of more visceral shots, I was thinking of lines of meat hooks and perhaps an old bloodstain somewhere. It had a lot of promise to say the least. So one day we drove out there, found that it wasn't guarded at all, parked the car and entered the compound. At first there was no creepy vibes about the place whatsoever and two of the buildings appeared to be just animal sheds. However, the more we looked around, the more we found what we were looking for. We discovered the machinery room, which looked awesome with all its mechanical guts exposed, and then we found the incinerator, so I took a few shots of that. The slaughtering areas didn't have any gnarly blood stains or anything, but the grates to drain the blood looked super ominous and creepy, even when they were just dirty with age. It's all about the implication, you know? But then there was the cooling room, which is exactly what you can imagine when you think of a slaughterhouse, where all the Texas chainsaw looking meat hooks are. We took plenty of pictures there, probably more than anywhere else, and afterward, we decided to head back for some beers and a little Chick-fil-A. However, on our way out, we decided to have one last walk around the building, just to see if we had missed anything. And that's when we discovered that the slaughterhouse had a basement. Down a set of stone stairs, there was this big iron door with a little window complete with iron bars, and from the looks of things, the only thing securing it was a big rusted padlock. Now, here's the point where I explained that I was only in this for professional curiosity. If I didn't want to take pictures, I don't think that I would have gone looking for some creepy old derelict to hang out and explore. But my friend, he was in it for the thrills of exploring creepy places, and the creepier they were, the better, he thought. He takes one look at the padlock, then one look at me, and I can see what he's thinking. But I'm like, hell no. I was just about done for the day, and spending God knows how long finding something to smash the padlock did not beat the idea of a little spicy deluxe at Chick-fil-A, as I said. So, we made a compromise. We would go get fast food, but then come back another day with a sledgehammer or a pair of bolt cutters to check out what we had missed in the basement. I said as long as we headed out in the early morning so I could make use of the morning light, he had himself a deal. It might seem overly obnoxious, but lighting is important in photography. That, and there was no way in hell that I was going anywhere near that slaughterhouse at night. Not even so much because I was scared of ghost pigs or whatever, but you get some real bad hombres hanging around these derelict buildings at night. Hombres that won't think twice about jacking me up for my expensive looking camera. Anyway, I think it was about a week later, but eventually my buddy gets back to me about that locked basement and asks if I'm down for a little breaking and entering. We weren't exactly in the habit of criminal activity, but I guess if someone wants to press charges or sue me for breaking their stuff, they gotta own up to what was in there first. I told him sure, but as long as we stuck to the plan and hit the place up early in the morning. He agreed, so we arranged a time and date and then drove back out there with a sledgehammer and a pair of bolt cutters, both of which my buddy had no trouble getting his hand on. 
He's still like that, the kind of guy who would probably poop out gold bars if he had the right motivation. We parked in the same spot, checked around the compound to make sure that we were alone, and then we grabbed the bolt cutters and the sledgehammer from the car and got to work getting into the basement. It didn't take us long to bust the lock off the door and when we pulled it open, it creaked like it hadn't been open in decades. We were faced with this long, dark corridor that seemed to cut the main slaughterhouse building in half and leading off of it, there appeared to be a series of rooms. We had these little headlamps with us, the kind that you strap to your forehead, and we spent a couple of minutes just peering down the corridor and checking for hazards. I think our main concern at the time was just snakes, pretty much, rattlers and things like that, but after tossing in a couple of rocks and not seeing or hearing anything, we decided to head in and see what was in there. The first room we came to had a whole bunch of wooden furniture stacked up in one corner. Most of it was smashed into pieces, but it only took a few seconds of looking it over to see that it was all old wooden desks and chairs. Now, I remember having a plastic desk and chair in school, but I knew enough to realize that it was all old classroom furniture, and this is without us noticing the chalkboard on the adjacent wall. But then, why the hell would you need a classroom in the basement of a slaughterhouse? We weren't exactly freaked out by the find as it made sense that new employees needed to be trained. Operating a slaughterhouse probably had a whole bunch of occupational hazards which would, in turn, require a lot of training. But then the contents of the next room that we entered made much less sense. Strewn all over the floor was a bunch of half-rotten notebooks and paper. It honestly looked like someone had trashed a library. And then, in one corner of the room, there was a small desk missing its chair and sitting on top of that desk was what appeared to be a smashed up ham radio. And the microphone was still intact, but the radio's main body had been completely bashed up beyond repair. As we went on looking around the room, we noticed something about all the books on the floor. If there were any pages left in them, they were blank and some looked like they had whole sections of paper torn out. Again, I get why any business needs books or records, but a radio too? Why not a phone? And why keep it all the way down in the basement, which would probably wreak havoc on the signal, you know? Again, this was pretty weird, but we're not freaking out or anything. Abandoned places contain all kinds of junk and trash, and if I'm honest, I've seen way weirder stuff than old moldy notebooks and a busted radio. But then the next room we entered, that's when we started getting some seriously bad vibes. We could explain away the classroom, the whole ham radio setup didn't creep us out, but what the hell would a slaughterhouse need underground cages for? At first, we had it in our heads that they were just for animals. I mean, it was a slaughterhouse, so go figure. But then why would they have three cages, taller than they were wide, and if you were going to put an animal in there? I'm not saying that's what they were used for, and I don't know. Maybe that's where they isolated sick animals that might pass their diseases onto the rest of the stock before slaughtering or something. That's just one explanation we thought of right off the top of our heads, and it still makes sense thinking about it now. But in that moment, standing there and looking at those cages, they resembled jail cells more than anything else. I can confidently say at that point that we were starting to feel creeped out. In fact, we were immensely creeped out, as the feeling really started to escalate rapidly. At that very moment, we realized that we should have just left. Despite capturing incredible pictures down there, it came at the cost of feeling increasingly uncomfortable. However, inexplicably, as much as we wanted to escape, we felt compelled to see what that final room held. You know the saying, curiosity killed the cat? I didn't truly grasp its meaning until that moment. It's not about ignorance leading to misfortune while minding your own business. Rather, it's about the burning desire to witness something potentially harmful, defying all logic and self-preservation instincts. Nothing in that ultimate room harmed us, obviously, or I wouldn't be here writing this, but I'm fairly certain that it would have if we had opened those items up. The final room housed two groups of things, one in each corner. In one corner, there was a pile of old-looking respirators, similar to gas masks but specifically designed to cover the mouth and nose. In the other corner, numerous blue plastic chemical drums were stacked. Until that point, we assumed that whatever had occurred there happened long ago. However, seeing those still bright blue drums, despite being filthy, indicated that someone had been there, 
possibly within the past year or so. The abandonment wasn't nearly as extensive as we had initially believed. As soon as we laid eyes on all that equipment, we promptly retreated from the room. Breaking into that place was stupid, I admit it, but we weren't insane. I've seen enough movies to know that chemical drums like those often contain dangerous substances. If it warranted the use of respirators, there was no way that we were going to open those lids. And that was the moment that we obviously decided to leave. I had captured enough genuinely eerie photos to fill a gallery. I didn't need to manipulate shadows or tones or anything of the sort. I simply photographed what I saw and allowed the subjects to convey the message, just like all great photography does. It wasn't until we were driving back to the city that we started discussing the possibility of maybe contacting the police. While everything we witnessed could be explained rationally to sort of quell our fears, those cages were a different story. We couldn't just brush them off with a simple explanation. The more we talked about it, the more I felt this creeping sensation that we had witnessed something that we weren't supposed to see. We went to this Applebee's for breakfast and just ate in silence, and then abandoned our plan to call 911 the moment we returned to the car. I was somewhat worried that the police would consider it a foolish prank call, but just as I was about to contact them, I realized something pretty important. There was no way to report what we had witnessed without incriminating ourselves in the crime. If we decided to proceed, we would have to do it anonymously, perhaps from a payphone or something, but we would never be able to follow up with the police to inquire about their investigation. It was a pretty tough situation, but ultimately we believed that we made the right decision. We found a phone and dialed 911, informing the dispatcher about what we had seen, and then ended the call after apologizing that we needed to maintain anonymity. I suppose 911 dispatchers encounter such situations more frequently than I imagined because of the lady on the other end seemingly understanding when I declined to provide my name. It was pretty disheartening to not obtain any closure. But several years ago, my mother had her purse stolen at gunpoint, and she had the opportunity to periodically contact the detective to inquire about the progress. Although they never apprehended the culprit, she found it immensely helpful in terms of overcoming that trauma. I desperately wanted to uncover the truth about the basement, but instead, I had to settle for waiting and scouring news headlines. I was anticipating stories about people confined in cages or bodies dissolving in these drums, but there was nothing. And to this day, I haven't heard a single story about any of the events that took place in the basement. I would like to believe that there was an innocent explanation for all of it, but a chilling sensation still lingers inside of me, suggesting that something terrible happened down there, something we were never meant to witness. My girlfriend told me about two weeks ago that she was waiting in line at the convenience store with her friend in Chinatown, New York City, when a large, dapper-looking man approached them. He complimented her coat and commented on how expensive it must be, and she said thank you and they chatted for a little longer. The man explained that his suit was just a shabby Brooks Brothers suit, but she noticed that he had all sorts of expensive jewelry on. When my girlfriend and her friend mentioned that they were students, he kept making assumptions about how they must be rich and that their parents were paying for everything. My girlfriend started feeling uncomfortable and tried to distance herself from him. He asked them if they had jobs and they told him no, as they were students. After that, he went on to tell them what he does for a living without being asked. He said, I do all sorts of odd jobs, this and that, but mainly, I have these guys that work for me. I find them off the streets, I feed them, and I give them a place to stay. I'm waiting to meet up with them now. He referred to them as his minions, which suddenly made something that seemed wholesome at first very unsettling. And then he told them that he just had his wallet stolen and needed $400 for something. I don't remember the reason. He told them that he would pay them back later that week, but he needed the money right that night. My girlfriend politely declined, and by this point, she was really uncomfortable. She started walking towards the door to leave and said, Nice to meet you, and good luck. They both walked outside and sat on a bench outside the convenience store. As they were sitting and discussing the strange interaction, 
They saw the man exit and stand about 10 feet away, waiting for a few minutes, looking at his phone. He then met up with his two other men, and they chatted for a few minutes. The large man in the suit then walked in the opposite direction while the other two men walked into the store and started holding it up with knives. Absolutely shocked and frozen, my girlfriend and her friend watched as the cashier put her hands up and emptied out the cash register. The two men ran out of the store in the same direction the man in the suit had walked. They were both about to call the police but noticed that the cashier had already done so. They waited at the bench until two police cars showed up and then they walked in to tell the officers what they had just witnessed and tried to help identify the robbers and the man they had just met. I wonder if this is a common occurrence in terms of organized crime, paying homeless people to commit crimes and rob. This happened about 10 years ago. I must have been about 27 years old or so. My partner at the time was in a band and we stayed in this converted garage. Not really converted, it was still very much like a garage. Concrete walls, damp, we made do. It was on a service lane, which is like a street that has businesses down it and the back of houses. He had come home very early that morning and gone to bed. His bandmate was living in a bus at the time, which was parked out front as they stored the gear next to our flat in another garage. I woke up at around 5am, hearing screams, mainly from a woman, but also very aggressive shouting from a man saying, I'm going to kill you, and so on. The area we were in is not the nicest, although now it's a very desirable location, close to the beach, boutique shops, etc. However, this was coming from a house that I thought was condemned. It was two stories, dilapidated with torn curtains and rotten wood, and about five broken down cars out front that had been picked apart. It turns out, someone was living in there. I woke up and went straight to the front door where I saw a man stomping around a parked car on the side of the road, chasing a lady in her pajamas around and threatening to kill her. I could see that she was screaming and crying. Out of instinct, I screamed something like, Oi, what's going on? I'm calling the cops. They both stopped and just looked at me. And there I stood, in my pajamas, barefoot near my door. The man wore a full leather jacket, pants and boots and had a half face tattoo, Tamoko. Even though he was across the street I could see the white of his eyes. He was obviously on something and furious. I'm going to kill you, he shouted at me, motioning to cut his neck with his thumb. When he turned to me, the woman escaped into the abandoned looking house and locked the door. Being brave or stupid, I replied, well, come on then, and grabbed a large plank of 2 by 4 that I kept by the door, since I found this area rather sketchy and would often be home alone on weekends. I had never used it, but it made me feel better having it there. I walked outside in my pajamas and leopard print robe, with the wood over my shoulder while talking to the police on the phone. I'm not the smallest woman in the world, I must have been around 80 kilos or 176 pounds and 5'10 in height, but he could have taken me out if he wanted. I think the idea of the police made him second guess. He got the hint and took off down the street. Another lady across the road also came out and we talked about our men not doing anything, her husband also stayed in bed too. Anyway, later that week, a lady came to my house thanking me for helping her niece. She explained that he was some kind of crazy cracked out guy who had fallen in love with her niece and wouldn't take no for an answer. He had come to her house without an invitation, expecting that she would welcome his drunk cracked out self with open arms, only to get rejected, which threw him into a rage and he proceeded to kick and beat her, chasing her around the street. About a week later I was told that he was arrested and taken away on my street. He was led away by the police handcuffed with a ciggy hanging out of his mouth. I was glad to hear it because I had been terrified that he would come back when I was alone. So towards the end of last year, one of my old high school buddies invited me to his 31st birthday party. We'd had this large group of friends that had all met in freshman year, but as we got older, we all sort of just naturally drifted apart. But then last year, 
This guy Danny thought that it would be a good idea to get all of us together again for his 31st. I'm not saying it was a bad idea, and seeing some of the old crew again for a few hours turned out to be just as fun as I imagined. There was just one problem though, and that problem was a guy named Dean. We used to be pretty wild when we were teenagers. Not bad kids, but definitely a pain in the butt for any parents or teachers. We were all about three things. Heavy metal, getting completely wasted, and chasing chicks. Absolutely nothing else really mattered. And things stayed like that for ten years, and then one by one we all realized that we were kind of wasting our lives. We sobered up, went to school, got jobs, and most importantly, started looking for healthy relationships with girls who had it together mentally, not just physically. We did so in different stages, some focusing on family, some on careers, but by the closing years of our 20s, everyone was on their way to being an actual grown-up. Everyone, except for Dean. Basically, Dean still had this idea in his head that he was going to be a rock star, and he cultivated the style to match. Long hair, tattoos, piercings, t-shirts that called Jesus the C-word, and he looked like the lead singer of a black metal band. The only trouble was... He was not prepared to put the work in to actually learn an instrument or form a band, you know? Crazy thing was, I think his strongest talent was drawing and illustration and he only ever drew cover art for the records that he was one day going to produce. And he stayed like that for years and years, and a perfect example of how far we drifted apart was when he announced that he was moving to a totally different city on the opposite end of the country to live with a girl that he'd met online. It was hard to be happy for him. I know that sounds incredibly mean, but it's true. We were losing a friend. He could drive you crazy with the way he acted, but Dean was our friend and we loved him like a brother. So even though he claimed to have found this perfect match for himself and that it might possibly be the thing that he needed to finally mature, it sucked having to see him go. Sure, we could keep in touch via Facebook or whatever, but it wasn't the same. We all missed him like crazy, but as much as we all wanted him to come home, we didn't want to ruin his new relationship, which was really obviously making him happy and making him grow up a little. He found a job out there, found him and his new girl a place to live, and it was actually awesome to see. It was bittersweet, but I didn't think he needed us anymore. He didn't need anyone to give him a swift kick in the bottom or call him out on his delusional takes because he was finally becoming Dean 2.0 in a way that we all had before him. But then, everything changed. I don't know the exact details of it, but Dean and his girlfriend broke up and it set him off on a downward spiral. He got fired from his job, his drug and alcohol intake skyrocketed, and he went off on the rebound looking to immediately replace the girl he'd lost. This is around the time that he and I stopped talking and I won't go into too much detail, but the reason I stopped responding to his texts was this. I wanted to help him and I'd offer to do so many times, but until he wanted to help himself, I couldn't just sit on the sort of outside watching him destroy himself. I offered him one last chance to get cleaned up, or I couldn't help enable him anymore, and he chose to keep on destroying himself. The last I heard about Dean before our friend's birthday was that he'd gotten with this new girl and they were expecting a baby together. I was surprised but obviously really happy for him, but for some reason, the person who told me didn't seem too enthusiastic. And that's when I first found out how crazy his new girl was supposed to be, right at the same time that I learned that they were pregnant. So as you can imagine, this had me pretty worried about meeting them. If they were just dating, that was one thing, but bringing a child into the mix is something else entirely, I'm sure you'll agree. Anyway, the guy who told me had actually met her around the holidays and literally said to me, this girl is bad news. This particular friend of ours usually doesn't have a bad word to say about anybody, so to have him say how toxic she is, that was no small thing. Now I know it might sound cruel, but that's exactly the kind of girl Dean liked. The kind just like himself. Tatted up, beer chugging, and incredibly angry. I think half the reason he and his first girl broke up was because he just got bored of her. I mean, there were rumors that he was cheating at the time of doing so. I don't know, maybe he was. But the point is... It was way too late for me to try and reach out and talk to him out of this relationship, and even if I had gotten in there early on, he'd probably have just told me to go F myself. Now anyways, that's all the backstory that you need. Now for the night of the party. 
So like I said earlier, the party was actually pretty good, even after Dean and his girl arrived. She seemed kind of nervous to meet us, but we were nervous too, so it actually made for some good vibes at first. She seemed intense, but she was fairly easy to talk to, and I started to think the warning that I had gotten might have just been a little overzealous. But then, they started drinking. Dean's dad was watching their 18-month-old back at his place, so Dean and his girl were free to party a little. I'm not saying that they were entitled to, I know from experience now that being a new parent is about the hardest thing in the world, but the effect the alcohol had on them was just depressing to watch. They got mean, and they got mean fast. Not so much to us or the other people, but to each other. Dean got up and walked off at one point, and he did it in this way that just seemed rehearsed. He knew to walk away from experience, you know? Like that same thing happened every time they drank together. With Dean having walked off to cool off, I guess, I started talking to his girl. She actually apologized and said that they were tired from the journey. Understandable given that they'd flown cross country with a new baby that very morning, but still, I was starting to understand why our buddy had seen it fit to warn me about her. Sometimes, two perfectly nice people are just terrible for one another. Love is weird like that, I guess. But the more I talked to Dean's girl, the more I realized how awful she really was. The more we talked, the more comfortable she got, and then slowly but surely, she started saying weirdly racist stuff about our town. It's a pretty liberal place, but it's hardly Portland or San Francisco or anything like that, yet she talked about the place like she was some good old boy disgusted with the degenerate north. The last person I expected to be talking like that was the tattooed goth girlfriend of a friend I knew thought politics was dumb. I'm not huge into politics either. I think it's all just a big circus, but I do take issue with people talking about stuff about our town. I tried to very politely confront her on what she was saying. After all, it was her boyfriend's hometown, and in all fairness, she did force a compliment before changing the subject. Not long after, Dean returned from wherever he had been in a better mood, so I went off to mingle a little more before going back to check on them. Dean was sitting alone, looking furious, so I asked him what was up. He told me his girl had said something to him, but that it was okay and they weren't fighting. The look on his face said otherwise though, but I didn't want to press him on it, so I tried a little non-confrontational catch-up to sort of lighten the mood. And it worked like a charm, and before long, we began reminiscing over this and that, swapping stories and just generally laughing our butts off. But then, and I can't remember what we were talking about, Dean kind of zoned out and started looking across the bar that we were in. It took me a second to realize that he had stopped listening to me, but when I did, I tried to figure out what we were looking at. That's when I saw his girl getting right up in the face of some other female. And before I could even suggest that we go over to help defuse things, the confrontation exploded. Have you seen how girls fight? They get brutal with each other. So by the time we got over there, it was like a whirlwind of hair grabbing, scratching, and just screeching. We got to work trying to untangle the two drunk ladies from each other and with Dean taking hold of his girl while I got a hold of the other. And just as I thought we were getting somewhere, the girl I was holding started wailing. There's a big difference between a scream for attention, a scream to intimidate, and a scream of absolute pain. Now, the latter is the blood-curdling kind of scream, the one that goes through you like nails on a chalkboard because you can hear the kind of pain the person's in. That's the kind of scream the girl underneath me let out, and although I didn't know what Dean's girl was doing to her, I knew it was bad from the racket she made. And boy was it bad. I didn't get a great look at the wound because the girl was hysterical and covering up her eye, but from the amount of blood that was coming out between her fingers, I could have sworn that she had a fingernail shoved into her eyeball or something. And by that time, almost everyone in the bar was freaking out, grabbing towels and bandages and calling 911. Since it was just this cozy little local bar on a weeknight, there was only one security guy who was totally out of his depth. He's trying to make sure no one else is fighting, but Dean basically grabs his girl right out from under the guy's nose, carries her outside, throws her in a cab, and then sends her back to his dad's place. I swear he did it so freaking fast too, again like it was this well-rehearsed move that he'd done many times before. After that, it was settled. This girl was terrible for him. First time I'd ever met her, and I watched her send another girl to a hospital with what looked like a life-changing injury. 
and needless to say, it totally killed the mood. The bar ended up closing early because it was now a crime scene. Dean insisted that we go someplace else ASAP because he didn't want anyone talking to the cops and we quickly went from a group of around 12 to a group of 3. Some had already headed home because of how late on a weeknight it was, but others just left once they realized what a horrible turn the night had taken. Either way, our numbers started to thin out and as we walked to another bar way down the street, I started to wonder if I should try and discuss Dean's relationship with him. It made me very uncomfortable to think that I'd just sent his drunk and violent baby mama home like that, so instead of making a whole thing about it, potentially starting a fight, I just made a very gentle suggestion to him. I told him that maybe, just maybe, he should have gone home with his girl to make sure that she got into bed okay. I was kind of worried that he'd take issue with me even suggesting that, hence why I put it to him delicately, but bringing it up that way turned out to be much more effective than I'd first thought. He didn't say that I was right or anything, but you could tell the thought was eating at him. His dad and his kid were in that house with a girl who had just put another person in the hospital, and she was still seriously wasted. He stayed quiet for a little while, clearly wrapped up in the whole thing while we tried and failed to move on and enjoy ourselves. The only thing that lifted our spirits was the sudden appearance of an old friend we didn't think could make it. We'll call him Andrew, which wasn't his real name, but the reasons for me withholding that little detail will be very obvious very quickly. He showed up on his motorcycle, which we all found very impressive, and we kept talk of the girl fight to a minimum so we could focus on catching up. Then, a few minutes into the conversation, something insane happened. Dean, who was obviously invisibly wasted, asks Andrew if he can take his bike for a spin. Then, the birthday boy and I watch in absolute horror as Andrew takes out his keys, hands them to Dean, and says, Sure. Personally, I didn't think this was actually going to happen. I thought the birthday boy might have spoken up and been like, What are you doing? He's drunk as a skunk. But he didn't. I think he was waiting for me to say the exact same thing, so as we were gripped by this weird, nervous paralysis, Dean walked outside, motorcycle keys in hand. Now the birthday boy and I just sat there, open mouth, looking at Andrew like he'd just grown a second head, and finally the birthday boy managed to say something like, What are you thinking? Andrew responded with a, What? Before everything finally dropped. He had been so wrapped up in showing off his freaking bike that he hadn't stopped to think that maybe, just maybe, someone who had been drinking for hours shouldn't have been riding it. What makes even less sense is how proud he was of his bike. He was anxious about getting the paintwork scratched but at the same time had zero problems handing the keys over to some drunk dude. We all rushed outside just in time to see Dean disappearing down the road, no helmet, and way over the limit. To be fair, Dean did lie to Andrew, saying, take it for a spin, not drive five miles back to his dad's place so he can check on his psycho baby mama. When it hit him that a very drunk and emotional Dean was about to make a ten mile round trip, he started to freak out, like, what did I just do? We were mad at him, but we were mostly mad at Dean for doing something so insanely irresponsible. It wasn't even the lying or the law breaking or risking Andrew's expensive bike, it was how he had just put himself at a huge risk without so much as a second thought. The worst part was how helpless we all felt. Someone suggested chasing him down in a cab, but catching or ordering one wouldn't be easy, and the driver would probably have to speed just to catch up with him. But then we realized that we could call ahead, get Dean's dad on the phone, and warn him not to let Dean drive the bike back. That seemed like our only way of actually salvaging the situation, and putting the plan into action only scared us even more. Dean's dad wouldn't pick up the phone. We only had his landline number, no cell, and there was no response. Now, this could have meant that he was sound asleep and everything was fine, but given how panicked we already were, we took it as a sign of disaster. We were convinced that Dean was going to get hit by a car, pulled over, and jailed thanks to a DUI plus no license or insurance and all that crap. It was either one or the other. There was no way a disaster wasn't about to happen. So when Dean suddenly reappeared on the bike maybe 40 to 50 minutes later, the collective sigh of relief was a pretty deep one. But that sigh of relief was very quickly replaced by a lot of anger. 
In Dean's logic, nothing bad had happened, so he hadn't done anything wrong. His girl was passed out in bed. His kid was in its crib in his dad's room, who was also asleep, so he just rode the bike back. Nice and smooth, no harm, no foul. He couldn't seem to understand why we were so mad at him, and in the end, he just walked off and presumably found his way home somehow. The rest of us stayed for one last drink to try and just shake off that terrible mood, and then we all went our separate ways and got ourselves home. Later on, as I was drifting off to sleep, I started to think about just how far Dean had fallen. He has this baby mama who seems destined to go to prison for something. I mean, we don't even know if the bar assault is going to catch up to her yet. He regularly drives drunk without a license or insurance, and he told the birthday boy that in the same breath as admitting that his baby mama hits him. Birthday boy thinks it's now up to us to do something about it, but what are we supposed to do? Time and time again, anyone who offers Dean help, he pushes them away and acts like they're just trying to control him. So to me, the choice is clear. I can try to involve myself in his life and be right there when he goes to jail, crashes drunk, or gets killed by his baby mama. But alternatively, I can distance myself and be emotionally insulated for when the inevitable finally happens. It would all be painful enough without a child involved, but that's the part that scares me the most. Some innocent child is mixed up in all of this, and that's infuriating as well as haunting. A colleague of my mother told her this story, and I got instant goosebumps when I heard it. Also, I'm not a native speaker, so I apologize if I make mistakes. My mom's colleague lives alone with no partner, parents, or children, just a dog to keep her company. However, every year during the summer holidays, she invites her cousins, who are her sister's children, to spend an evening with her. They watch movies, play games, and eat candy, and the children absolutely love it. Since she lives alone, she only has one bedroom. When she has a sleepover with her cousins, she lets the children sleep in that bedroom while she herself sleeps on the couch downstairs. So last summer, she organized a sleepover with her cousins as usual. It was fun and she had just put the children to sleep in her bed. Tired but satisfied, she plopped down on her couch and soon fell asleep. At around 3 a.m., she was woken up by her dog barking restlessly. This was quite abnormal because her dog never barked at night. Still half asleep, she got up from the couch and walked over to her dog to see what was going on. She bent down to pet her dog and said, Hey, what's wrong, buddy? And as she said this, she heard someone behind her in the darkness respond, I don't know either. She started screaming and immediately ran upstairs to lock herself and the children in the bedroom and called the police. In the end, it turned out to be just a drunk man who had entered the wrong home. But dear God, I would have soiled my pants if this happened to me. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because I'm not sure if I'm simply overreacting or if it's something more. I was shopping at an Asian grocery store with my boyfriend and his mother. We were in the meat area when I decided to take a couple of steps to the side to tie my hair up. I didn't want to do it in front of the meat. However, my boyfriend and his mother weren't that far away from me. All of a sudden, when I was almost done fixing my hair, I saw an Asian woman walking towards me, looking into what seemed like a pocket mirror. I thought that she was simply going to walk past me, but instead, she walked directly up to me. I was a bit startled, but I managed to say, Hi, do I know you? And instead of replying, she proceeded to get close enough to my face that I could feel her breath. She wouldn't get out of my face or say anything until several minutes had passed, and my boyfriend and his mother noticed this weird stranger. They asked me if I knew her, and I shook my head, and it was only then that she started walking away. I kept seeing her throughout the store in areas where I was, but she never approached me again. At this point, I saw her having a conversation with some guy, so I knew that she wasn't one of those people who couldn't communicate. I still have no idea what she wanted. About a year ago, I stopped at a random gas station off the highway in the middle of the desert, somewhere between California and Arizona, 
because it was evident that there wouldn't be many opportunities to fill up anytime soon and I didn't want to risk it. It was an absolute ghost town with nothing around for miles, just desert, mountains, and maybe a few trailer homes here and there. There were no other cars in the parking lot other than two semi-trucks parked about 300 feet away. Now anyway, I walked into the gas station to use the restroom, and a woman greeted me, which made me feel more at ease. We were the only two there. I went back outside to fill up my car, but my car was parked on the side of the building that wasn't visible from inside the store. A dumb mistake. While my car was filling up, I decided to clean my windows. It was pretty windy that day, so there was a lot of dust and dirt flying around. Well, once I finished cleaning the last window, the front passenger side, I put the squeegee back in its bucket and put the gas nozzle back in its place. Now, while doing this, I suddenly had the feeling that someone was looking at me. And I looked up, and through the car windows, I saw a man about 30 feet away walking towards me, just staring at me and I immediately got a horrible gut feeling. Because it was so windy, I didn't hear his footsteps approaching, and it was like he popped up out of nowhere. Once we made eye contact, I noticed that he picked up his pace a bit, and the next thing I knew, I rushed to open the door, which was on the other side of the car, facing this man. Within seconds, I hopped in, turned the car on, and immediately drove off with the door still open. He was probably about five feet from me at that point, I had to loop the parking lot to leave, and I looked back at him, just standing there, watching me drive off. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience, and someone took control of my body, but maybe it was just the adrenaline triggering my fight-or-flight response and my instincts kicking in. After that, I drove in silence for a solid 20 minutes. I think about what would have happened if I had looked up a couple of seconds later. Alright, this happened when I was 11 years old. I had a friend, 12 years old, over at my dad's house for the first time, and we were having a lot of fun. My dad went out in front of the yard to make a phone call. It was around 10.30 at night, and we were hyped up on Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, feeling hyper, so we went outside with my dad. We mainly stayed in the front yard until we decided that we wanted to go inside. My friend and I jumped over my back fence since we were right next to it. For context, I had a pit bull and a very large German shepherd who were also in the backyard. My friend and I went up to the second floor where we played with makeup. About 30 minutes later, we went back downstairs because I heard my dogs barking and decided to let them in. The dogs had their own fenced off area in the backyard to not interfere with the garden and my dad hadn't let them in yet. My friend pointed out that my dad was still on the front porch, which was okay. I went to my back door to open it, and that's when I saw a man crouching by the back gate, staring at my back door. He was next to the side of the gate that we had previously jumped. I asked my friend to stay there and make sure that the man stayed put while I went to check if my dad was still on that front porch, and he was. However, for some reason, I didn't tell my dad that the man was in our backyard. Instead, my friend and I watched him out there for about 20 minutes. After those 20 minutes, he moved across the street and crouched next to a car for 5 minutes and then came back to the gate. I decided that it was unsafe for my dogs to still be out in the yard, so I turned on the light to help me see clearer and opened the gate for the dogs. Even after I let my dogs in, this guy was still crouched there, just not moving at all. Now 10 more minutes, which felt like 10 hours to me, passed by and the man was still there, but he stood up. Seeing him stand up, I realized that he was holding something that looked like some sort of blunt object, maybe a metal pipe. I quickly locked the door, and my friend and I ran across the house to the front to tell my dad to come inside. I never gave him an explanation as to why, but I'm guessing he saw the urgency in my face or voice, and he listened. In the late 1990s, I accompanied my mom to England so she could see where her grandparents had lived. I was basically just there to look after her because my dad didn't want to come and my mom has a hard time doing things for herself. Our agreement was that after spending a week in England, the second week we could spend in Ireland. 
but my mom is terrible at planning, so we ended up spending a week sort of in limbo in Liverpool, waiting for the Irish Sea to calm down so we could cross on a ferry. It was September, probably the worst month to try crossing, and we never made it to Ireland. So anyway, for five days I had to try and find places for us to sleep at night because she also made no hotel reservations for an entire two-week stay, and I was completely unaware of this until we were already in England. I picked a hotel that seemed okay, and my mom paid to sleep in a different room because she has really bad RLS and shakes violently at night. It keeps everybody up. In the middle of the night, I heard a man yelling in the hallway. He had to have been very intoxicated. He was pounding on the doors all the way down the hallway and hitting the walls. Being the punk kid I was, I made the mistake of acknowledging his rage by telling him to shut up. And this really enraged him. He started beating on my door, screaming that he was going to kill me. He tried the doorknob, and thank God those doors had an automatic lock. I started looking around the room and realized this hotel had no phones in the room. Like I said, this was the 90s. I went to the window, but I was three floors up and the windows didn't open either. So I just stayed there, listening as he did his best to break the door down while threatening what he was going to do to me once he opened the door. And this went on for at least 20 minutes. Somehow, I finally fell asleep. And when I woke up the next day, I saw just how much damage he had done. He smashed in my door with a fire extinguisher that he pulled off the wall. There were dents and marks all down the hall where he had dragged it violently from end to end. The worst part was my mom down the hall never said anything. When I told the clerk as we were checking out, he looked at me like I was crazy and making this up and I told him, go look yourself. Later I asked my mom about it and she said, oh yeah, I thought I heard screaming. Was that you crying for help? You all were enormously supportive of my last library creeper post. Working with the public lends itself to endless strange encounters, so I'll keep posting as they roll in. We were five minutes from closing the library tonight. Mondays are very slow in the summer, so at five minutes to close, we were basically just waiting for the clock to tick. All tasks are completed. You may get one or two stragglers to pick up a hold, but not often. It's generally very quiet. Not tonight. This man walks in and I say, Hey, we're closing up, can I help you? He hollers from the entryway, I'm looking for a book. Okay. Well, if you come to the desk, I can help you. He rushes over and says, You close at 11, right? I've worked here over six years and we have never closed at 11. I tell him no and ask again if I can assist him. By this time, my two other co-workers are up front with me asking what's going on and who's shouting. He just continues to stare at me like I have multiple heads, and I ask again, can I help you? He says he needs to use the phone and reaches for my desk phone. Nope. I move it away and tell him that he can use the public access phone in the lobby. But at this point, he only has about three minutes to do so. He again reiterated that he knows that we close at 11, and I tell him absolutely not, we close at 8. By now, we're all thinking this guy is going to be a hassle to evacuate the building at 8, my coworker is waiting near the lobby asking what she should do. Since I'm the person in charge, it's up to me to decide how to handle this. No pressure. I told her I'll go with you and let's check the restrooms. Close down the bookstore and start shutting off the entryway and lobby lights. My other coworker I direct to stay near the phone. This guy is just odd and if things go south, we need help in a hurry. We're all feeling really edgy at this point. She and I turn off the lights... He, meanwhile, is scrolling through the public phone call log, not making a call at all. It's just a random listing of numbers, so I don't know what he expects to find there. I tell him it's time to wrap things up and we need to close. He begins to head back into the library. Oh no, I'm pregnant and exhausted and ready to go home, and he's not going back into the library. As loudly and as assertively as I can, I say, We're closed and you need to leave now. He then tells me that we close at 11. I don't know if this man is on drugs or simply confused, but he needs to exit. My coworker backs me up and says that he needs to leave or we're going to call the police. He finally relents and heads out the door. We pull everything closed after him and ensure that it's all locked. 
I look at my coworkers and say, no one leaves until he leaves the parking lot, okay? They both readily agree. The last thing we need is him harassing us off the premises too. We wait, and wait a good ten minutes until he finally drives away. I don't know what this man's deal was, but I hope he won't become a regular library creeper ever again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or over email, and you might even hear your story featured in the next video. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't try and pet the Leopards. <laughs>